Friends, it is a very nice day to be spent in a dark room thinking about uh, complex issues. Yesterday was raining, today it's sun shining, just for you to believe that the Tuscany sun is uh, not a myth, but a reality. We are very happy to welcome you here. It's a pleasure for us that you are visiting the UI and give this lecture in the framework of our newly established uh, Debating Europe discussion series. And you are the right person to participate in this series because you are, as well as an academic, as a practitioner with a strong background, you are the perfect speaker to participate in this kind uh, of events. Let me introduce you from the, both the academic and professional point of view. Our lecture today is a doctorate in law from the University of Turku and was a professor at this university and, and another university called Abo Academy, which is not an Arabic name, but is a Swedish, Swedish name. Okay. Uh, Judge Ross has published several important works on European Union constitutional law, uh, has coordinated several international research projects. He represented the Finnish government as advisor and an expert from the United Nations, UNESCO, OCE, the Council of Europe. He served as a principal legal advisor and deputy director general at the legal service of the European Commission. And since 2002, he's judge at the European Court of Justice, where I suppose you met together. Today, he will speak on the EU sovereign date debt crisis from a constitutional perspective. No doubt, this is one of the most uh, pressing and important issues on the current situation of European politics. And to have a look at that from the a constitutional perspective is for sure something that maybe we are not very much used because we think about it more in political economic terms. Well, uh, dear Professor, the uh, Judge Rosas, European leaders have been claiming all the time to do all it takes to fight and to stop the Eurozone crisis. And why reaching decisions have been taken in the last two years and so many times we have been listening, okay, this is right, that time we solve it. This is an historical moment because we found the right solution. I've lost the count of how many times I've been hearing that this was the right solution and this was an historical moment. Among these actions, there are many measures that affect uh, member states' constitutions. Spanish constitution was changed this last summer in a hurry. I know that the Finnish people refuse to change the constitution, as well as the European treaties has already been changed. And finally, there is the European Fiscal Compact, which has a strong impact, both from an economic and political uh, point of view. So this is a right moment to think about the crisis in constitutional terms, and you are for sure the right person for doing that. So I'm going to give you the floor. You have uh, as long as you want, but... Uh, Be careful now. <laughs> <laughs> well... In the European Parliament, you would have had uh, three minutes, <laughs> but here you will have 30, <laughs> which is a lot of time by comparison with uh, the practice in the European Parliament. And then uh, Professor Maduro will guide the following discussion, because I'm happily I will not be able to stay with you till the end. Thank you once again for being here with us. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. President. Uh, it's, um, as I had occasion to say already yesterday when I was talking about EU fundamental rights in this room, it's always a big, big pleasure to be in this room and, and also to see many uh, colleagues and, and, and friends. Uh, this time, and maybe contrary to my habits, I feel very humble. Uh, I feel humble for at least 
two reasons. First of all, because of this very high level attendance, including the president of the university. And secondly, because as you already alluded to in your introductory remarks, uh, it's, it's a very difficult subject which is also moving and changing all the time. And, and there's a lot of um, words and perhaps not always matched up by deeds. And, and so it's not very easy to exactly follow events and to try to distill from those events uh, those elements which are particularly important from what I would call a constitutional perspective. Uh, <clears throat> I'm far from being an economist and there's a lot of what's going on when I'm trying to read newspapers or other publications also on the more economic side exactly what in economic terms this or that solution will, will imply. Uh, I, I, I don't always understand exactly. And, and there are options presented which do not match and so on. So it's, it's a little bit also of a mess, at least from my point of view. But um, obviously I will, I will, I will focus on, on, a, on, on the legal perspective and, 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 uh, and even, even there I will try to, to avoid going into nitty gritty as it were. Um, concerning the details of secondary legislation, for instance, and try to focus on on some main developments of what what I would argue are or, are, or at least may be of, of constitutional importance. Uh, I've um, prepared also a, a PowerPoint text, which uh, also I think has been copied. Uh, yes, and I even see that that you, you have it in front of you. I will not go through all, all those, so for, for those of you who, who may be interested in, in some details, I will not touch upon, uh, I'll, I'll refer to the, to the written part. Um, a background, a lege lata, first of all, uh, where are we today from a, from a legal <coughs> perspective? Well, as has been said, uh, but this is maybe in, in hindsight, it was not probably said so by so many people in, in, in the 1990s. Introducing the euro was like building a house by starting with the roof. And um, what now is being done, or at least there's an attempt to do something, is to try to to, to construe also a ground and, and maybe even some, some, some floors. Um, to simplify very much, uh, I, I just contrasted here uh, two provisions from the beginning of the Treaty on the Function of European Union. If you compare what is said about economic and employment policy in Article 2.3, first cited, then with what is said about monetary policy, which is an exclusive competence. Uh, you will already see a hint uh, of the fact that, that while monetary policy, for obvious reasons, goes quite far uh, in regulating things, also then on, on, on the basis of secondary legislation, economic policy has been thought of as, as a special kind of a shared competence, but, but where the sort of union role has been conceived at the very beginning as, as rather limited and complementary. Um, there's a lot more to be said, uh, but uh, we need to, uh, to, to move on. I'm not going into all the details of the treaty on the function of the European Union, I'm just reminding everybody uh, in the room that uh, there are a number of, of articles related to, to economic and monetary union, articles 119 to 144. This is existing law, obviously. It is not something that has been construed during the two last years. And I mentioned some examples which 
may be more important than the others, and, and above all, this no bailout clause, uh, this um, prohibition um, to uh, uh, take on directly responsibility for the uh, debt of other um, member states, and especially a prohibition to, to sort of um, give, give money directly either from the central bank or from member state to another one. But then there's an exception in Article 122, which also has been used recently as a legal base for, for, for something what has been passed uh, last autumn, um, which uh, talks about uh, severe difficulties caused by natural disasters or exceptional occurrences beyond its control. Um, and um, that exception clause also has triggered a certain dis discussion that I, at least to some extent, will come back to, uh, to what extent uh, the existing treaty has been interpreted in a flexible, broad manner, uh, or, or, or rather the other way around. Now, uh, a more also, I would say political and economic question is, is this a debt crisis or a euro crisis? Because you see, uh, especially many politicians uh, declare uh, quite often that this is not a euro crisis, it is a, it is a sovereign debt crisis. Well, personally, I would prefer saying that it's both. Um, it's, of course, a debt crisis because <coughs> what what happened during the last two or three years was really concretely triggered by what something I, I would call uh, too much debt, uh, especially of some uh, member states, but because uh, the member states that are members of the euro has lost the possibility to print money to fix the base, basic uh, um, interest rate, um, and so on, uh, it also becomes a crisis for the Eurozone in itself. Um, it is true that some countries have encountered difficulties or are encountering difficulties, and I'm mentioning two examples, Iceland and Hungary, which are not part of the Euro. So obviously from there you can see that, that you can run into difficulties also outside the Euro. But on the other hand, it's, it's according to, to me, uh, just a simple uh, reality that despite the fact that the United States and the UK certainly also are quite heavily indebted and that the uh, total debt of the United States is mounting all the time and, and it seems to be quite difficult to, to, to limit it, uh, these two countries are not, not far from it experiencing the same difficulties the interest they have to pay in order to get more loan by selling state obligations is not very far from the German uh, uh, interest rate. Um, and uh, why is that? Well, I think the answer is obvious. Among investors, whether we like it or not, whether these investors are right or wrong, morally or politically, uh, it's a reality that um, uh, there has been a lack of trust in the in this construction of a common currency with a roof without without a basement and 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 walls and there has also been this has been ag aggravated by a certain lack of trust in the ability of the eu institutional framework to take decisions other than just words Again, um, all this, this lack of trust might be exaggerated. We, we may not like it, but it's there. And, and we should maybe also sometimes remember that, that these um, terrible investors that we think are so, sometimes so immoral and, and, and specul speculators and whatever uh, are to a very large extent pension funds and, 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 and similar. Uh, which are taking care of the pensions of 
of, of European or other populations, and, and they have a certain responsibility, obviously, also to try to save uh, the money that they have invested in. So, so it's a mixed mixed bag. But, but this, is, this is obviously a, a non-legal uh, comment. Now, uh, to go a little bit more into the, the legal framework, uh, we speak about the Stability and Growth Pact. In fact, legally speaking, it's, it's a question of, of mainly of certain articles in the Treaty on the Function of the European Union, complemented by two protocols of primary law status, protocol number 12 and protocol number 14. Uh, and then we have uh, already since the 1970s uh, secondary law, uh, mainly in the form of regulations, which are uh, laying out uh, details. And uh, in, in this current jargon, the, there is a distinction between the preventive part of the SGP and the corrective part. The preventive part is centered around Article 121, um, and the corrective part, which includes also sanctions, and this is existing law, it's nothing new, is in Article 126. And I'll uh, skip over uh, the details. What is <clears throat> However, worthwhile mentioning as, as also a constitutional comment is that control and enforcement and sanctions, especially if you look at Article 126, is centered around the Council. And in practically speaking, the only case that my court has had in this area, a case that was decided in 2004, Commission versus Council, uh, the court uh, said, uh, and I quote, responsibility for making the member states observe discipline lies essentially with the council. <coughs> and the commission has a more limited role than it normally has as a guardian of the treaty. And if you look at the last paragraph on the screen, you will see that in the context of Article 126, there's an exclusion of infringement procedures, in other words, uh, commission versus member state. That doesn't concern Article 121, the preventive part, and it doesn't necessarily concern all secondary law in this area. It's, it's a rather complex picture. But the main thing which needs to be underlined is that if um, you move into the sanctions field of 126, paragraphs 9 and 11 in particular, uh, then uh, through the force of paragraph 10, the Commission may not bring infringement actions. In, in a newspaper article I wrote uh, before Christmas for a Finnish newspaper, uh, the title was, or the question in the title was, does the sovereign debt crisis depend on one sentence? And, and that one sentence was this sentence in Article 12610 that infringement procedures are, are <coughs> excluded. Well, my answer was mainly no. I don't think that is the ultimate reason for the debt crisis. But I would, I would say that it's rather symptomatic of the philosophy behind uh, this construction it's more a, a, a political control centered around the council and other words, member states themselves rather than the normal procedure commission infringement procedures. And I think that partly probably explains why we are where we are today, but this is obviously not the, the only explanation. I'm uh, very bad at controlling myself. Uh, my wife, who I think is in the audience is much better. And that uh, also goes for member states' governments. Uh, it's not their fault, it's simply an objective reality that if, if you put all your eggs in the council basket and you think that then control of the rules will be effective, uh, 
uh, you will probably be mistaken, and at least this is what happened in this particular area. And so, uh, already in 2003, when uh, uh, there was a possibility that some member states, including France and Germany, uh, were faced with the possibility of sanctions, uh, uh, they persuaded the Council, uh, uh, in fact, not to do anything. It was decided that the excessive deficit procedure be held in abeyance for the time being, as the English text said of the Council political conclusions. Well, this decision or these political conclusions of the Council were attacked by the Commission before the Court. So litigation between the Commission and the Council or between a member state and the Council and so on is possible. So it is only infringement procedures, Commission versus member states that are excluded by uh, 1, 2, 6, 10. So this case was obviously possible. It was not declared uh, uh, inadmissible by the Court and while, uh, without going into details, you could say that the Council won the case on one leg of, 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 of the litigation, on this particular point, uh, uh, you could say that the Commission won in the sense that, that these political conclusions of the Council were declared illegal by the Court. But that did not change the political and economic reality. Um, the idea had, had sort of been both served and, and also accepted more or less by all member states that these uh, famous uh, debt uh, criteria of the Stability and Growth Pact, in other words, 3% deficit maximum of, of gross domestic product and 60% uh, total debt, that they were more recommendations. This was the psychological result of the discussion and the development which took place during those years, irrespective of the court's uh, judgment. Um, and uh, as uh, all member states now that uh, were part of the euro were sort of protected by this shield of the euro, uh, which brought down uh, the, the interest rates and, and, um, and implied that you could have cheap money, so to speak, uh, then uh, it, it led to, uh, to, to this indebtedness that we, that we now see. Um, you could, of course, speak a long time about that and compare the different states, Ireland and, 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 and Greece and so on. I'm not going into those details here. I think we all more or less know the the, the situation. Um, a legal, one of the legal aspects of this is that um, while sometimes we only speak about Greece or only about Portugal, in fact, the big majority of the Euro member states are not respecting the three and the 60 percent, as, as you probably know. And um, as far as I can tell, four member states, including one which has not op ad adopted the euro, Sweden. It's a country with a member state with a derogation, as it said. Uh, only four member states uh, are considered at the moment as respecting fully the three and the 60% uh, rules. Now, what has been done or what has been tried at least. Uh, in the discussions about the new intergovernmental treaty, especially when it takes place in newspapers, you have, you have the impression that this is something completely new and that nothing has happened before. Well, in fact, a lot had happened already before Already in September 2010, so not 11, but 10, the Commission put forward uh, a big package of legislative proposals, the so-called six-pack. Uh, and these were uh, finally adopted around October 
September, October, uh, most of them in legislative procedure with both the Parliament and the Council, but, but it depends on which of the, of the six acts you are speaking about. There are five regulations and one directive. And two of the five regulations are just modifications, but important ones, of the regulations which have existed already since the 1990s. Um, this is a very complex already area when you start analyzing the details of these regulations and this one directive, and uh, we don't have time to do that. And, and by the way, I would not be very qualified even for doing so, or even if I tried to read those regulations several times, uh, in any way I've forgotten about most of the details because it's so complex. Uh, but it is clear that overall, the overall impression is that there is quite important developments already included in the six-pack which entered into force in mid-December and also was before Christmas published in the official uh, journal. And um, I think one point from a constitutional perspective is worthwhile mentioning, and this is the question of the qualified majorities. Because here you have what is called, it's a second paragraph on, on the screen, you have something you call the inverted qualified majority. In other words, the commission proposal is accepted unless you have a qualified majority against, which of course is the other way around, uh, which is the normal rule. There are also, I think, one or two provisions in this six-pack where uh, it's enough to have a simple majority, but it should be against, not for in favor, but against. But most of the decisions that you take according to the six-pack uh, are, are through this inverted qualified majority. And this is, of course, an interesting phenomenon, and we can also ask ourselves, is this something that might be uh, taken over or copied or, or in some way uh, used as a model also in other contexts which maybe have, will have nothing to do with, the, with these matters that we are dealing with today with the debt crisis and economic and monetary uh, union. If you can do this by secondary law in this field, why would you not be able to do it also in other fields? This obviously relates also to the power relations between the Commission and the Council, and I will come back to that at the end because I have tried to sum summarize some conclu concluding remarks. Uh, there are also new proposals proposed by the Commission in November 2011, and in this intergovernmental new treaty that I'll, I'll speak about in a, in a minute, there is also a sort of uh, at least an endeavor clause saying that the, that the, that the member states that ratify this or, or adhere to this um, new intergovernmental treaty uh, also adhere to the objective of trying to adopt as quickly as possible these two new legislative proposals that build on the six-pack. So you could say that if and when this is adopted, it's a sort of a six-pack plus uh, that will exist, exist at, uh, mainly at regulation uh, level. And then there are, just to make this picture even more complex, there's a lot of uh, soft law um, documents and instruments which have been adopted during the last years, and this is a little bit part of what the President also alluded to, that you have this string of summits, and, and there's apparently some, some great need at each summit always to produce something which then can be presented to the press. And sometimes it's, it's called um, a new strategy for jobs and growth, and sometimes it's called the Euro Plus Pact, and, and, and so on. Uh, some of this is not any longer, or will not any longer be just soft law, because either in the six pack or in the six pack plus, assuming that that will be adopted soon, uh, they have integrated part of these soft law instruments or at least elements of them. So soft law is at the same time becoming hard law, which um, of course may mean 
in the long run that also these soft law documents are not necessarily just of a, frankly, blah, blah, blah uh, relevance, but they might also be something which uh, will stand the, the, the uh, a little bit longer and, and, and maybe at some point have a certain <coughs> relevance. Um, I think it's high time now to say a few words about what we have been reading about in the newspapers during the last two months. In other words, this by now already famous summit of um, 9th December, uh, and um, also the constitutional challenge of amending EU primary law, as you know, the, the original idea was to amend primary law uh, and there were main, two main options. One was, I think, mainly advocated by Germany and, and, and to some extent France of amending, for instance, Article 136 of the Treaty on the Function of the European Union and possibly also 126, I don't know. 136 is an, is an article which is limited to the member states whose currency is the euro. Uh, but in order to amend that, you need the agreement of everybody, because this is primary law, even if the effect is only for, for 17 member states at the, at the, for the time being. And an other option, the alternative, I think, was more uh, advocated by Mr. Van Rompuy, and that was to amend uh, protocol number 12. And protocol number 12, which is contains the details on the Stability and Growth Pact, for instance, the famous 3% and 60% rules, is interesting because, like some other also primary law documents, including, by the way, the statute of the Court of Justice, can be amended in a, in a simplified uh, procedure. Um, when it comes to, to Protocol 12, it, it, it certainly means unanimity, but it doesn't mean treaty ratification. Uh, so you need the consent of all the member states, but you don't need it to be ratified. And that would probably also mean that you can avoid, if you wish to, referendums, um, if, uh, if that otherwise politically or constitutionally is, is required for in the, at the national uh, level. Um, as, as you know, even this possibility, in other words, that, that have a unanimous decision making amendments to Protocol 12 and perhaps limiting them only to the Euro states uh, did not meet with the approval of the United Kingdom government, um, which uh, during this famous night was requiring, while stressing that you should not touch the internal market, you should protect the internal market. At the same time, they wanted exceptions from internal market rules. Uh, in other words, to go back from qualified majority to unanimity. And that one can perhaps understand or not understand was rejected uh, by um, many other political leaders around the table. And that then led uh, the British Prime Minister to say no to any change of primary law. And that, of course, then uh, triggered this third option. In other words, not to amend EU primary law, but to make an intergovernmental uh, agreement instead. Uh, and um, these negotiations, as you know, were, were concluded end of of January, and, and unless something has happened during the last days that I haven't been catching up with, the idea is to, to sign this in, in beginning of, 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 uh, of March, I think the second uh, March. So we know uh, the text. And um, uh, let's see whether there was something. Uh, well, at, at the end, um, uh, there is something which um, is a short summary of Article 3, which is really, which has also given course for the name of the whole treaty, a fiscal compact. 
there's the different criteria. The main rule is a structural budget deficit, this time of 0 0.5, but there are also exceptions to this, and, and it's more complicated than that. And then what, from a constitutional point of view, of course, is, is interesting, is this obligation to put these budgetary disciplinary rules, including a corrective mechanism, which should be used at the national level, into, and the starting point was uh, the national constitution. But as the president already said, there were some member states, including one I, I, I know well, in other words, Finland, that said that this uh, might be uh, impossible in the short time span that, that all this is meant to, to enter into force because of the majorities you need to amend the Finnish or, or some other constitution. And so what you find at the end is, is through provisions of binding force and permanent character, preferably constitutional or otherwise guaranteed, note the or, or otherwise guaranteed to be fully respected and adhered throughout the national budgetary process. And then you have um, uh, this um, obligation in, um, in, um, in seven, uh, which tries to tackle something I didn't mention so far. When I talked about the uh, inverted qualified majority rule, in other words, commission proposal is un adopted unless uh, there is a qualified majority in the council against. That is only when decisions are taken directly on the basis of the six-pack legislation. But when you are taking a decision which is directly founded on Article 126, uh, there, obviously, by secondary legislation, you can't amend the, the, the majority uh, rules, which are the general rules of the treaty that you need qualified majority in favor in order to adopt uh, something. Now, to get around that and to introduce through the back door somehow this inverted qualified majority rule also to primary law, you have this obligation in, in, in Article 7. Uh, in other words, the contracting party who, parties whose currency is the euro commit to support. So it's a commitment concerning voting behavior. And, and this has been thought possible despite the normal rules in, in primary rule, that you commit yourself to a certain voting behavior, so you commit yourself to support it unless it can be found out, I suppose, by the chair that there would be, and, and I say would because you, you don't vote at this stage, that there would be a qualified majority against. And if there's not a qualified majority against, then everybody is committed to vote in favor. This, of course, is only based on the intergovernmental treaty. This is nothing that you will find in EU primary law. And then, uh, as we also have been able to, to read in newspapers and otherwise, there's also a certain role conceded for the European Court of Justice, um, spelled out in Article 8. And... Um, while there were some efforts to cast the net a little bit wider, uh, the end result is that this jurisdiction of the court would only apply to Article 3.2. And Article 3.2 is this obligation to have the national constitutional or other rule which implements the budgetary discipline rule, including the corrective mechanism. So it's only that obligation that the Court of Justice is empowered to control according to the new treaty. How is it possible to give such a role to the European Court of Justice? Well, it is even spelled out in Article 8 that this is a special agreement within the meaning of Article 273 of the treaty on the functioning <coughs> of the European Union. And what do we find in Article uh, 2? Seven, three, the Court of Justice shall have jurisdiction in any dispute between member states which relates to the subject matter of the treaties, 
if the dispute is submitted to it under special agreement between the parties. And so the new intergovernmental treaty says that I am a special agreement in accordance with Article 273. <coughs> and why is there a limitation in this jurisdictional clause saying that only another member state may bring? Well, that is precisely because Article 273 only speaks about disputes between member states, not disputes between the Commission and a member state. But in order to, how should I say, modify or improve or whatever that uh, limitation or, or, or diminish its importance rather, uh, there is also a reference to the Commission saying that if the Commission concludes by a sort of an opinion that uh, this Article 3.2 of the same treaty has not been respected, then there seems to be a kind of an obligation for member states to bring a dispute. Uh, however, the, the wording is not perhaps uh, crystal uh, uh, clear in, in that uh, <coughs> respect because it says that the matter will be brought, it's a second paragraph on the screen, the matter will be brought to the court by one or more of the contracting parties, will be brought. Is this empirical or normative? Um, then there is a may clause, in other words, a possibility clause for other situations. In other words, that there's not this type of commission uh, opinion which uh, precedes uh, the action. Um, and uh, then there's also a clause saying that if the member state, which then has been uh, concluded eventually by my court, to be in violation of Article 3.2, there's a possibility for a member state to come back, uh, reminding us of the possibility in Article 260 in proper infringement procedures for the Commission to come back to the court and ask for fines or lump sum uh, to, to, be, uh, to be paid. And there's even a reference in that connection to Article uh, 260 of the treaties. And then um, um, I, I note that the, at the last paragraph that, uh, that also partly at the instigation of the European Parliament, but probably also the Commission and, and some member states, uh, the, there is a, a clause foreseeing a future incorporation of the treaty uh, into, as it said, the legal framework of the Union. Now, quite another part of this picture concerns the stabilization mechanisms. And here I propose simply to mention it in order to save time. I think you all, all have been reading at least the basics in newspapers that we have two existing facilities, one run by the Commission and where the EU budget functions as the guarantee, but that's very limited money because it's, uh, it's only 60 billion, well only, but in, in this reality we are living today, you say only 60 billion, not million, but billion. Uh, but then, then you have the EFSF, which of course is financially much more important, and where you have guarantees of more than 700 billions, but the lending capacity is more than 400 billions, not uh, millions. And legally, of course, this is also an interesting phenomenon because it's a, it's a, it's a formally speaking, a, a, a private limited company under Luxembourg company law, the EFSF, uh, directed by Klaus Regling, who seems to uh, be together with uh, Juncker and Olli Rehn in, 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 in current press conferences, a former director general of the, of the commission. And Klaus Regling has also been asked by the states that are um, owners of this private law company, uh, the states are owners of it, uh, he has been asked also to prepare for the permanent mechanism, the ESM, which was originally meant to enter into force next year, but now there's an effort to bring that forward. And there's also been an effort to move 
a little bit more to qualified majority voting within that framework. The idea is that this ESM should become some sort of European monetary fund uh, to some extent corresponding to the International Monetary <coughs> Fund, uh, which of course also is involved in all these debt uh, structuring um, efforts that we see at the moment. And that's why Madame Lagarde also uh, takes part in these press conferences nowadays when they come out from this or that meeting. Um, and uh, we were told by, with the Treaty of Lisbon that the Treaty of Lisbon will be in force for at least 10 years or even more and, and now we don't want any treaty <coughs> amendments anymore. And we also had the UK veto which prevented uh, further treaty amendments in December last year. Despite all this, we do have a treaty amendment also going on at the moment. A small addition to Article 136, um, which was done by the simplified revision procedure. So there's a, a decision of the European Council, not the Council, but the European Council. It needs the approval of all the, 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 the member states uh, but not technically speaking, treaty ratification, because this is uh, uh, a simplified revision procedure. And uh, in that small addition, we can read that, uh, that the member states whose currencies, the euro may establish a stability mechanism to be activated if indispensable to safeguard the stability of the euro area as a whole. Well, this is not yet in force, Despite of that, we already have the EFSF as a private company today, but this um, obviously comes a little bit exposed and in any case is perhaps more uh, geared to, to take, take, take into account the, the creation of the ESM, the, the permanent stability mechanism. I would very much welcome comments and questions and that's why I propose to, to, to now I jump to to my few final uh, remarks. Um, I think it's clear that through this process also the economic policy leg of the two-leg um, plan, ec economic and monetary union, uh, uh, has been or will be reinforced. And one can even ask whether Article 2 of the Treaty on the Function of the European Union is, is, will be any adequately reflect all this, uh, which um, has taken place by a small amendment to Article 136, but then by a host of secondary legislation which goes quite far and then all this supplemented by an intergovernmental uh, treaty. Another question we can ask ourselves, well, is this and to what extent one more step towards what I would call multi-step or multi-speed Europe, not two-speed Europe. Already today it's not two-speed, there are a number of different speeds depending on whether you talk about Schengen or whether you talk about the Euro, about defense policy or, or, or I mean, the, the, the differentiation and flexibility. Um, and you can also, if you just look at the recent development, see that, that there, there is also a tendency to, to have, have different speeds among the non-Euro uh, states. You have, of course, two states with an exemption, that's Denmark and the UK, which is at the level of primary law. And then you have the others outside the euro with a derogation. But there seems to be also now a difference between Denmark and the UK, and the Denmark might join the new intergovernmental treaty. You have, you have some member states which, if the euro will survive, and I personally believe it will, will join the euro in the not too distant future. There are some others, including probably Sweden, that will still reflect quite some time. But also Sweden is a member state with a derogation, not a member state with an exemption. In other words, there's an obligation in principle of Sweden to join. By the way, and this we can perhaps uh, 
discuss also uh, how do you leave the euro. Uh, there is of course no no mechanism for for that in the in the in, in the treaties. It's the it's a contrary. It's the presumption that all member states are or will be in the euro, and then there are only two that have an exemption that has been accorded by primary law, but the others have an obligation to join as soon as they fulfil the criteria. Uh, so how can you how can you get out of this? And what what are the limits of law and constitutional law in 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 in, in such developments? Then we have the classical question of. Uh, union versus member state competencies, intergovernmentalism versus community method. Some people say that this is intergovernmentalism par excellence. We have these summits, and 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 it's it's Mr. Sarkozy and Mrs. Merkel, and 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 sometimes some other leaders are also mentioned, and and they make these deals, um, and and then they go out and tell the world what they have agreed on. Uh, on the other hand, if we look at a little bit closely, and I think I mentioned already many examples, we can ask ourselves if not the end result of this intergovernmentalism also is more supranationalism and more powers for the European Commission. I mean, look, look at the role of the Commission according to the six-pack plus legislation, if we assume that it is all, all in place and, and up and running. Um, and, and, com and especially this question of inverted majority voting, uh, which means that it will be practically impossible to stop a commission proposal from being adopted. So in other words, the power passes to the commission, obviously. Uh, so the, the picture is much more complex, and, and when Olli Rehn, my compatriot, is, is called the budget czar, sometimes obviously also with negative connotations, uh, it is not so 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 f distant from from the truth. I, I I think it seems to me, but again, one of the things we can discuss. Uh, and one thing related to this, and I'm just mentioning it in passing, is overcoming unanimity, um, which of course also normally tends to strengthen the hand of the Commission, uh, as compared to the Council or 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 other. Uh, intergovernmental, more intergovernmental institutions. Uh, I've mentioned some examples here, uh, and and I just uh, note that that is a trend, but it depends on what you look at. Is it the founding treaty of the ESM, or is it the six pack, or there are different rules for different situations. Now, then you have uh, something I already hinted at earlier. The the uh, question of flexible treaty interpretation. Uh, of course, some people have said even that there have been violations of primary law. I think the former, we have to say former uh, uh, German federal president, uh, Mr. Wolf, uh, said in a speech, I think last summer, that that uh, it was very questionable legally what, what was being done, and it was a too flexible interpretation, of, especially of Article 122. Um, also considering my my present role and perhaps also my future role in someone who will look at also concrete cases brought to the court, I, I, I can only mention this discussion without perhaps being too specific, uh, without prejudging uh, any any future judgments of the of the court. Uh, and then the, the the final point, which is related to the existential question, will the euro survive, will the EU survive, and, and that we are all as wise or unwise. My personal guess, it, it will survive. Uh, and I, I would even dare to say that the decision-making procedures, uh, while of course being very complex, are also part of a certain reality that we cannot at least change uh, even if we if we wanted to at least not very quickly and sometimes it might also be useful to make a comparison to the united states is it necessarily so much easier in the united states to tackle the budget deficit uh, i i think at least i have been reading a lot during the last year about the complete sort of uh, freezing of, of of any development in the us because of inability of the congress and the president to agree and so on so <clears throat> We should perhaps not exaggerate it too much. Uh, 
it's another matter that obviously uh, personally one could have wished, and I think many of us would, that there would have been a little bit more deeds uh, than words, and, and, and that sometimes um, things maybe should not have been said which have been said and so on, but maybe this is also inevitable that in this kind of crisis situation that has not been foreseen, that there also, as Donald Rumsfeld would say, stuff happens. Uh, is this undemocratic or democratic? I don't know because I don't know exactly what democracy means. But I would say that I, I prefer personally legitimacy, whatever the difference between the two. And, and what I would say as a, as a sort of a very personal and concluding remark is that given if all this is coming to fruition and, and if the euro will survive and so on, this will mean a strengthened position for the European Commission uh, and, and the commissioner in charge will be a sort of a budget czar and so on. That this obviously highlights the problem of, 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 of legitimacy. And, and, and I think from that point of view, it's perfectly understandable that, for instance, uh, the leading uh, government party in Germany has, has put forward a proposal uh, that the commission president be elected in general elections. Uh, this is, of course, only one way we, we, we all m might have our ideas what, what to do now and how to, how to increase legitimacy and also how to increase the, the perceived legitimacy of the European Parliament, but, but also more broadly of the whole construction. And that is, of course, a tremendous challenge that at least I am not able to solve. I'm just throwing this out as a possible also basis for, for discussion. I, I'm grateful for your patience, and, and um, I hope that we can have a discussion. I'll take it, I'll take over. So um, I will moderate the debate and also make some uh, initial comments and perhaps some a list of points that may be relevant uh, for the discussion. Uh, it includes some some questions, most of them uh, uh, on the legal aspects of what you mentioned. That I think, uh, and um, and that y you should not feel obliged to answer all of my questions, neither all of the questions in here, and uh, because I know also that in some cases you, you, they may conflict with your duty to have a certain reserve, as you mentioned, with respect to issues that may uh, later, at a uh, later point in time, you will have to decide as a, me as a member of the court. So let me start by the last point that is a more open one and, and less political and less legal one, that is the the political, uh, uh, the legitimacy question that you mentioned. Because one of the interesting aspects that your talk highlights is that most of the decisions and the steps that have been taken so far by the European Union have to do with the prevention of a future crisis, not with solving the current crisis. The idea is that if we put in place, seems to be that a belief that if we put in place the mechanisms that let the markets know that we will have the capacity to supervise and control national fiscal policies in such a way as prevent future prices, that this will somehow be internalized in the market, in the way the market is dealing with the current crisis and solve the current crisis. I, I think that reality so far has proved this, this assumption uh, wrong, that at least that the mechanisms of of constraints and discipline do not seem to be enough to reassure the markets and, uh, uh, in, in this respect. But they also raise a deeper legitimacy question, that is, if the European Union does play and will play in the future, as you said, the kind of czar on the part of the Commission, but also the control of other national governments in the Council on national budgets that will come and be discussed there before they will be discussed before national parliaments, if the Union will play that role, it is also indirectly and increasingly responsible for the economic effects of the fiscal and economic policies of the states. I'm not sure if the Union has itself internalized what this means in terms of 
political and democratic accountability with respect to this population of the states. We were talking yesterday for dinner, and I was giving you the example of Portugal because it's the kind of good student at this moment. The unions even accept the, the, the social pact to reform the labor legislation. And I was told you, so far, people have accepted the austerity, austerity that has been very tough. I mean, a lot of people in Portugal have, have seen their salary decrease 30% last year. And people have accepted that. But there is a kind of assumption on their part that this will work. And if in two years they will still see things the same or worse, it will not be simply the Portuguese government that will be blamed. They will say, well, we've done everything that you've told us, and we are in a worse situation than, than we was. Who is to political responsible for this? People will want to find a political responsible for that. So this is what the broader legitimacy question. And then I wanted to move more to some legal, legal questions, uh, knowing that you might not be totally free to answer them uh, 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 the, the first one has to do with, the, with also one of the, your last points, that is, how does one leave the euro? How can a state leave the euro? Uh, I will reframe the question uh, as, how can one state lawfully leave the euro? I find that very difficult to happen. And, uh, uh, just a couple of examples. For a state to leave the euro, it has to be done from one night to the other. The other. It has to be done in a matter of hours. Uh, so a state will have to frozen bank accounts, immediate violation of freedom to provide services and free movement of capital. It will have to do a forced conversion, immediate violation uh, uh, not only of a possibility of saying that the euro is not guaranteed only by the state, but it's actually guaranteed by the European Union to the European citizens of every member state, but also Im immediate violation of the regulations that give the right to anyone in any state of the European Union, not only the euro states, to have accounts in euros. Immediate violation likely uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the directive that guarantees uh, uh, deposits up to 100,000. It's one of the things that the EFTA authority, together with the Commission, is charging Iceland. That is because of the bank systemic failure, they were not able to pay. This will happen if there will be a, 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 euro, a, a, a default in a, in a euro country. Uh, and it's, they don't seem to think about this. So how could this lawfully happen is one, one question. And the other one too is uh, how, because that will be the alternative, how can a default happen within the euro itself? That is. Also in, in uh, a lawful way, because I would assume that one of the possibilities for a state to try to say, okay, we simply don't pay, but we stay within the euro. Yeah. And I would assume that on the one hand, this will probably amount to a violation on the part of the state of uh, several EU rules, including with regard to the banks to which they have own. All this will probably uh, will, will amount to not only to contractual violations regulated by national law, but these contractual regulations, they will be violated by national law. Maybe the state could address it through national law. But the problem is that a lot of them, because they will entail discrimination probably, will involve two violation of, of EU rules, so very difficult. And the other hand is that the possible responsible to, response to that is that the European Central Bank will not provide credit to the state uh, uh, if a state will default with, while trying to stay within the euro. And that itself might be considered as a violation of EU rules on the part of the ECB against that euro state area. So one interesting thing is basically, how can uh, everyone is talking about the possibilities of the fault and all this kind of thing? No one seems to discuss minimally. How can that be? It's not simply to uh, an organize and, and not uh, 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 orderly or disorderly the fault. It's either orderly or disorderly, how can a default take place in compliance with your rules? I don't see it. And I would like people to, the, to discuss that. I don't know the extent to which you might be able to have a position on that. One, one other question has to do with the, with the fiscal com compact. An interesting question. Uh, the court certainly has a jurisdiction over it, but it's a limited one. And it is an international intergovernmental agreement. So one question that I have is, to what extent, and this has to do with something we discussed in the roundtable last week, to which extent is the international agreement enforceable as international law or as EU law? This is relevant in terms of the enforceable mechanisms that and the obligations it imposes on the member states. And so, so that's one question that I think might be interesting to address too. Um, there are also relevant questions regarding the obligation to implement into national law the, the budget limit, the, the, the Article 3rd, uh, and the extent to which uh, 
uh, uh, uh, that may require referenda in some states or not. I know this was one of the issues discussed in Finland. I don't know if you want to have a, a, a position on that because this will be relevant for some, sta for some states in, with regard to ratification processes. Um, I, I, I'm trying to be very brief, and so I'm, I'll just limit two more questions before extending them to the, to the audience. One has to do with the commitment that you mentioned that one finds in the Intergovernmental Treaty on the part of some states to vote in a certain direction. It's basically a coordination of voting on the part of some uh, 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 of the Euro states, or at least those that are part of the fiscal compact, not necessarily only the Euro. Well, the, well, it can be uh, 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 other states. It yeah. It could be even... In, uh, uh, this, uh, we, one also... Uh, sees examples of these, of these arrangements as political arrangements. I mean, the Euro states were already coordinating their positions, but it was political. Here we have it in, in the agreement. Uh, this was another issue we discussed and that I raised l last week on the round table. Is I have some doubts as to the lawfulness in light of the treaties of such kinds of what, what I would call voting syndicates. I mean, the fact that some states agree between themselves that they will agree on a particular position that then they will take on the decision-making process with other states, no doubt affects the rights and obligations of other states in the context uh, as defined in the treaties and their voting power as defined in the treaties. I, I find this very problematic. Uh, and so, uh, again, I don't know the extent to which you can <laughs> express your position on that, uh, but I wanted to raise the, the issue. Now, uh, one final issue regards to, it's, it's connected to this because it has to do with the reverse qualified majority. Uh, um, isn't this de facto an amendment of the treaties? It's a mechanism similar to the passerelle, for example. And the passerelle itself was in the treaties, and even there, some people consider it as, uh, the, the German Constitutional Court uh, uh, did basically, uh, they did not uh, accepted it. Uh, now, before we had already even in the legislation, it was already part of the Six Pact, this revised qualified majority agreement. But we could say that because it was in the legislation, it was a, basically will not be enforceable in terms of EU law. When it is part of an international agreement, intergovernmental agreement between the member states, I'm not sure the extent to which this obligation, either we construct it not as a legally enforceable obligation, or if it is a legally enforceable obligation, I think it, we, can, we can say that amounts to a form of amendment of the treaties, perhaps. So these are only a few questions, but uh, let's, let's collect a couple more questions uh, 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 from other people too. Have one, and then, two. yeah. Okay. If I may, Judge Rosas, I would like to build on, on this argument of legitimacy, which I find uh, we are in some, some way, through this international treaty, um, having the European Union decide in a national budget, budget how they shall be made. Apart from uh, what we see uh, in Article 13 of the Treaty of European Union, so that there is uh, um, a unique institutional setup which is somehow touched by all these uh, modifications, we also have to think about legitimacy, about the role that potentially is taken out of national parliaments in having a scrutiny on national budgets, which now is not longer uh, in place. I would like to compare and contrast that, if you may, also with Article 13 of the Fiscal Compact, which has foreseen a scrutiny of, uh, let's say, a kind of scrutiny of uh, national parliaments and... Uh, European Parliament of this mechanism. And the first meeting uh, of the European Parliament with national committees about budget is going to take place on the 27. So if, if I may have some comments about that, that would be really valuable. Thank you. I will collect two more questions before giving back the floor, and then we'll have a second round. Perhaps you can state your name and... Arevika uh, Mkarchan, Economics Department. So uh, I will ask a question as a non-lawyer. <laughs> um, I think yesterday or two days ago after this um, meeting where it was announced that the Greek, Greek government will uh, pass a law, will write and pass a law 
that will also make haircuts on the bondholders that are not willing to participate in this haircut. So from my understanding, this is a default as an economist. This is a clear default. So my question is, will there be announced a default on March 20 when uh, the state will not be able to meet the contractual agreements by changing these uh, rules of the contract ex post? Thank you. So, Gregoire Malay, I am uh, also a non-lawyer, and uh, I have a question for for the lawyer. It seems to me that um, the idea to put in the constitution of uh, the member states this golden rule, this rule that they will uh, respect the budget deficit constraints and uh, overall debt is uh, a way to send a signal that in the future they will be more serious because it's in the constitution. Uh, now I'm wondering as a non-lawyer if uh, for me it's kind of sure that in the future there will be cases when even if the rule is in the Constitution, it's, not, it's going to be violated. If it's in the Constitution, does it change something? In the sense that if the government is found as breaching its own Constitution, does it give new powers and talk that we don't talk about to basically uh, uh, cancel the government and who would take that decision? And is it thought of in the discussions at the EU level, or is it just a way to say, oh, we'll put it in the constitution to send a signal to the markets without thinking of the constitutions for all the member states whose relationship with non-constitutional government might be different in all the cases? I don't know about that. Thank you very much. Well, if you don't mind to answer this, this first set. Um, Well, I, I can try to, to say something. Uh, I, I can't, it, it's not because necessarily I, I, I would not be able bec because of my current position, but partly probably because I will not remember all, all the points because it was already a rich uh, uh, discussion and, 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 and pertinent questions. Um, but if you allow, I, I can at least pick up some of them and then we can see. I. I I can come back to, to something I, I've forgotten about, if you remind me. Uh, yes, indeed, how can you leave legally the euro, the, the question by our, our chair. It's also very difficult for me to, to see how, how you could do that legally. Uh, I mean, as I, as I said in my introductory remarks, it's, it's rather the contrary. There's an obligation to adopt the euro and that obligation applies in, in principle to all member states. It's part of the European Union edifice. But two member states have been able to negotiate a protocol, one on Denmark and the other on, on the UK. They always have the possibility, according to that protocol, also to announce that now they give up this exemption. So that doesn't require the consent of the others. That also shows that there's in principle, even for them, an obligation to join, be it not for that exemption. Uh, as long as the exemption is in force, uh, obviously, um, they, they can stay outside. The others have, have an obligation. It's a, of course, you could say that it's a very soft obligation. It's maybe a sort of endeavor clause um, and and there's a condition in other words that you fulfill the criteria the economic uh, criteria and 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 the reason why sweden legally speaking is not joining is that sweden says, says that we do not fulfill the the the, the criteria uh, but there's obviously nothing on 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 how to how to leave well you can of course always <coughs> 
modify primary law. Um, you can you can write in uh, an, uh, an, an escape clause or, or new exemptions if, if if everybody agrees, but that that requires the the agreement of everybody. If you have that, then obviously um, you can do it. Um, but that would also require the agreement of the member state concerned. So you can't obviously amend primary law against the will of the member state that you eventually would like to throw out of, of, of the euro. Then there's this host of secondary legislation relating to the euro and the internal market and so on that, that our chair mentioned. I, I, won't, I won't repeat that, that you would sort of by necessity almost, I, I, I suppose, violate. I mean, of course, these things happen in history. Also, states are broken down and currencies are broken down and so on. So, so, so things may happen that then get out of control. Uh, and, 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 and then, technically speaking, you, you probably would say that this is violating a lot of rules. But on the other hand, um, history will be the final arbiter of this kind of, 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 of developments. And that concerns, obviously, the whole, whole of EU as well. Um, nothing is it eternal. Um, <laughs> well, this is related to also what I think you and maybe some other also hinted hinted to this is to what extent is the intergovernmental treaty, uh, including also the jurisdictional clause on on the Court of Justice. To what extent is that EU law? Uh, there are people more qualified in this room that have written books and, and learned articles about agreements between member states. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I, I should be very, very, very cautious in saying anything in this in this field. But um, so much is clear that, as mentioned also in my introductory remarks, the uh, new treaty is. Is and, and, and in particular its jurisdictional clause are built on Article 273. And 273 speaks about dispute between member states which relates to the subject matter of the treaties. So that obviously shows that, that by definition, supposing that the treaty fulfills that criteria, uh, you are not completely outside EU law somehow. And, and in fact, the legal basis, in a certain sense, is already in EU primary law for the court's jurisdiction. So, so, so you are you are somewhere between two chairs. It's it's the rest of the treaty is obviously uh, more outside EU law, and also the language says that it should be later incorporated into the legal structure of the union. So that must mean that it is not today part of the legal structure of the union, but but it's not completely outside either. It complements primary law. You can't amend, according to Defren and some other decisions on our court, you can't amend directly primary law by, by, uh, by not respecting the procedures that the treaty provides. But according to practice, Schengen and so on, you can somehow supplement. And, and what is the difference between supplementing and amending? I mean, that of course also a classical question of legal theory. Um, but now I think my role as a judge will prevent me from <laughs> continuing <laughs> this discussion, at least um, being more specific. Uh, I just mentioned in passing that indeed it's, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon, both legally and politically, uh, this question of, of, of trying to somehow circumvent the, 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 the treaty provisions providing for, for qualified majority and, 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 and adoption of council decisions, for instance, foreseen in articles 121 or 126 of the treaty, by this, as you say, a commitment concerning voting behavior, uh, which is in the intergovernmental treaty. I, I looked um, at a very fresh, some of you might have seen it, uh, editorial note in the new Common Market Law Review of, of, of this year. And there the an anonymous author uh, more or less seems to give a go ahead or a green light to this, uh, saying that uh, 
that, well, you don't really technically change actually the voting rules, but you, you just create a sort of commitment to behave in a certain way, and that you always have these ally alliances and, 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 and deals between member states that if you do that, then I can support you on that, and, and that you should see that in, in, in that light. Um, people might, of course, have other views uh, on, they, on... They have a legal commitment to be themselves. Yeah, well, you... You, you, anyway, you, yeah, you, you said it. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, there was a question about national parliaments and, and, and respect for, for their role, and this, of course, has, has to do with legitimacy and, 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 and democracy and national democracy and, and role of the nation state and, 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 and so on. Well, yes, indeed. I mean that—that that is uh, part of the reason why I, why I also said that we really probably need to to think hard about the improving the overall the legitimacy of the EU structure. Um, that being said, let's not dramatize too much either. Uh, the budgetary disciplinary rules. I mean, the basics has been in force since the Treaty of Maastricht and confirmed in later treaty amendments. So we should remember that, that the intergovernmental treaty and what it contains, it certainly contains some novelties, but the basic things have been there all along, and they have been adopted, some of them in national referendums, etc., when countries are, have joined the, the EU. It's simply that nobody took those obligations and rules seriously. Um, that, that is, of course, a political change, but legally speaking, the three percent and the sixty percent and all—that that's not new. It's simply the, the mechanisms to try to, in, to 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 take it more seriously that is new. So, uh, from that point of view, uh, we have had in in a certain sense that problem with us already for twenty years or or even or even more. Uh, I'm I'm not trying to diminish the problem. I'm I'm just saying that this is not just out of. Of, of, of the blue that this has been created now. Um, I've, I've been reading in the newspapers that uh, indeed if, if there's a forced haircut then there's a technical default and this is related I think to these credit uh, swaps and whatever they are they are called. Uh, but I, I, I can't it, it's beyond my competence to, to really say anything meaningful about that, except that I would be very surprised if EU leaders declare this to be a default. I think they will try to present it in quite another, another light. Um, new powers for, if I understood it correctly, for the EU institutions and maybe the Commission and so on, because of uh, with a question mark, because of now something be in the national constitution. Well, there, first of all, I would like to, to recall, as I already said, said at the beginning, that, um, that the, the obligation, uh, to the extent that it is a legal obligation, of Article 3.2 of the, of the Intergovernmental Treaty, uh, is um, um, only provisions of binding force and permanent character preferable constitutional or otherwise guaranteed to be fully respected and adhered to throughout the national budgetary processes. So what certainly, if this goes forward, does give a new power to the court of justice and, and through that also to the other member states and indirectly also to the commission, is to check whether that basic obligation has been adhered to. But it is not an obligation to have something in the Constitution. And, and, and then when, whether you have it in the Constitution or, or in some other legislation, I can't at least for the moment foresee that that necessarily would then make in the, in the aftermath, in the running of business, so to speak, mean a, a, a huge, huge, make a huge importance. But that is perhaps also very difficult to, to predict at the moment. What is meant by permanent? I mean, also, does it require some kind of special legislation which would be more uh, 
something more than normal legislation, or, or, or what does it really mean? But there, I can just throw out the question, because this is precisely an issue that may come before my court in, in the future, uh, probably, uh, whether, well, I would say whether we like it or not. There is Dennis and Uli. I think this will be the ra last round of questions, uh, and then. Um, you mentioned uh, you mentioned the euro crisis, but as as I'm sure you'll agree, it's actually not one crisis; it's a series of crises. And um, I was I was interested in in the fact that in your remarks you don't mention one of the central players in uh, the crisis, and that is the European Central Bank. Um, I mean, I don't see how you could talk about legitimacy, markets, and national fiscal policy without talking about uh, what the, what the ECB does. Just to give you. Uh, an example, um, I think it's fair to say that the bond markets forced what uh, La Repubblica and uh, the people of Italy could never do, which is, which is getting Silvio Berlusconi out of office. When Italy's short-term borrowing rates went above 7%, that was a crisis. That was a crisis of the Eurozone, right? And, it, and, the, and the worry was that it's going to spread to other member states, and it did, right? The single greatest crisis in the last 90 days has been the short-term funding of sovereign debt in the bond markets. Now, what Draghi did was brilliant, right? Draghi engaged in quantitative easing. He said, you give me your paper and I'll give you money at super low interest rates for a long period of time. And that solved the crisis. But I hear a lot of people say that that's totally illegitimate, right? Jean-Claude Trichet would never have done that. So the, the question I have for you is, there must be a place for the ECB in your, in your story, because uh, it's so tied up with the crisis itself and these questions of legitimacy and national economic policy. Uh, I think the two questions identified by M Miguel were uh, among the most important questions. And as Alan has diplomatically avoided to reply to the first question and uh, to some extent to the uh, second question, let me come back. Uh, Miguel, aren't you basically wrong? That is, uh, your first question was, <laughs> your first question was, does the increased responsibility of the EU Commission and of the EU Council in the preventive function, in controlling violations of the budget deficit, uh, fiscal deficit, or uh, debt deficit, doesn't this entail uh, responsibility for the corrective function? That was your first question, I think, that you, you said in two, three years' time, if the people in Portugal, Greece, and Spain see that all this austerity uh, following from the budget disciplines does not work, they will hold the EU institutions accountable. Politically, that may be right, but legally, it's clearly wrong. If you read the Lisbon Treaty, the Lisbon Treaty is and continues to include a bailout prohibition. The Lisbon Treaty focuses on the preventive function. This preventive function has clearly failed. All 13 of the 17 Eurozone countries have persistently violated the rules during uh, six, seven years. The governance prevention function has also failed politically in the EU and the uh, national level. But your consequence that this might entail an EU responsibility for the corrective function is clearly inconsistent with the bailout prohibition. It is clearly inconsistent with the subsidiarity principle, that is, uh, fiscal policies, debt policies, national economic policies remain primarily national policies, and the Lisbon Treaty perceives the consequences as a national problem, rightly or wrongly, but that's a legal situation. So uh, I think uh, there are many who would argue this is a strength of the Lisbon Treaty, that if you circumvent the bailout prohibition of the Lisbon Treaty and assume uh, uh, pass the ball to the member states and say national parliaments now have to agree on bailout agreements case by case, this fortunately has to be approved by parliaments. So I think uh, I would very much doubt whether your logic would be uh, correct. The second question I think is very topical, but I, I recall I was 40 years ago in the legal commission, in the legal service of the EU commission and drafted a paper, can the United Kingdom leave, get out of the European Union? Of course, the rules said no, but the reality, I mean, everybody knew it, it is possible. 
and I think as soon as we have the first bailout uh, agreement, uh, uh, which doesn't work, and if you read the Financial Times from today, everybody agrees the Greek bailout agreement will never work. So as soon as we have the first sovereign debt default, I think it's obvious that the EU has to uh, adopt rules on sovereign uh, uh, debt defaults like we have on private debt, de debt defaults. So I think that is sooner or later it will come. In the case of leaving the EU, it has taken 40 years until the e EU treaty has been amended. But I think as, one as, we, as soon as we have a sovereign debt default, we have to adopt rules about it. One final question before I give the floor to, to Holland. I'm, I'm not going to, because of obvious reasons, I will only say that my point was politically, not legal, but we will talk on the break. One, one final question. And then just to let you know that there is a drink at the end of the talk and everybody is welcome and we can continue the discussion during the drink too. But final question. Um, I, I would like to develop something that Professor Maduro said in the beginning about accountability. Because I come from Greece and you know, what you hear in Greece and in the news is that, you know, who to blame about this and who to blame about that. And when people were voting about the bailout last June and then, you know, last week, you know, there, there was all those kinds of events and they were blaming the parliament. But as Professor Maduro is saying now, you, we see a new kind of representative democracy within the EU where, you know, we see a, a, sh a shift of power to centralized institutions and you know you see national parliaments that basically ratify foreign decisions so i'm wondering if as professor maduro said you know could those centralized institutions be held accountable on what is going to follow within the next 10 years in greece and in other you know states that are in the same situation. Thank you. First of all, on the <clears throat> European Central Bank, I couldn't agree more. Uh, there are many things I, I didn't, didn't say for reasons of timing and, and the role of the, of the Central Bank also in the financial control of banks and, 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 um, and, and insurance companies and investment uh, funds. Th through the three agencies in London, Paris, and, and, and Frankfurt, and then the coordinating role of the European Central Bank and its president, and, and there are many other s developments which certainly are very, very relevant. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I wouldn't, I mean, this is a, maybe a detail in his historical terms at least, but, but whether there's, there was a difference in approach between Trichet and, 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 and the current president and so on, and what are the effects of a certain letter being sent, and what are the reasons for a certain prime minister who has resigned, and so on. There might be many other reasons as well, I think. Uh, so I wouldn't exaggerate that part necessarily. But certainly, uh, the, the, the role and importance of the European Central Bank more generally is, I fully agree, is something that, that is certainly part of the constitutional picture. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are of course central banks which m more far reach in powers in, 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 in also in, 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 in countries either inside the EU or outside the, the EU. So the, the, the powers of the European Central Bank are rather limited as compared to, to London and, 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 and Washington. Um, the question of relation between preventive part and, and, and uh, corrective part and, and the question of legitimacy and so on. Um, I'm not sure I exactly follow the debate between you two, um, but I, I think I would agree at least with Miguel on, 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 on that one point and, and you also recently f concerning Greece made that same point that whatever are the sort of legal relations between these two parts, it's just a fact of life, it's psychology and politics, that um, it's conceived in, in member states as a, as, a, as a big question of who are those, who is this Mr. Ray and where, where does he come from and what, what gives him the right to impose something. Uh, I, <coughs> I followed recently 
as I tried to do every Sunday, uh, the political discussion in, on, on, on Belgian Francophone television. And um, uh, Oli Rehn had just sent them a letter saying that, that there's still one billion that they need to get rid of in the next budget. Uh, and nobody was, because this was Belgium, nobody was questioning that, but they were rather just discussing how to implement also that letter. In, in other words, how in addition to the, I think, uh, 12 billion that they have already sort of somehow dispensed with, they will still in, in, a, in a couple of days, and they did find one more billion to reduce in the, in the expense, expenses part of the, of the budget. But obviously people f following that television debate were probably asking this question, uh, who is this Mr. Rehn and, and what gives the commission this, this right and so on. Uh, <clears throat> and this of course is a long, 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 long debate uh, and, and uh, I just first of all can repeat that, that it, it underlines the need of, of doing something uh, also at the, probably at the institutional level with the European institutions. However, I can't resist the temptation to say we should, after all, not forget, I don't say that it's necessarily the solution, but we shouldn't forget that if the European Parliament, whatever we think of it and whether we think how legitimate it is or not, but it's at least all of us have the right to vote. If we don't vote, that's our, our problem, perhaps. Uh, it's, it's elected in, 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 in at least something close to, to, to general elections. If the European Parliament tomorrow adopts a political resolution by a majority saying that only Rehm must go, he goes immediately. So he's not just uh, that technocrat civil servant that can sit there and do whatever he likes. He, he, he goes immediately. It's not according to the primary law rules because they have to get rid of the whole commission, but the president of the commission has made a commitment that if an individual commissioner has a, a vote of non-confidence, then uh, he will get sacked, so to speak, which are in the power of the president of the commission. Um, well, I think that was, that was it. I'm, of course, more than happy during the reception if there are additional questions also to try to answer. I think you all join me in thanking very much Judge Alan Rogers for...